Bonsoir, désolé pour le retard. C'est vrai, on a eu des, quelques problèmes techniques, mais ça s'est arrangé. Et euh, je suis très content que ce soir, on peut commencer notre cycle de conférence donc, pour les 10 ans de double master franco-allemand ENSAS KIT, qu'on commence ce soir avec la conférence de Moritz Dostelmann, qui est donc euh, un jeune professeur euh, à Karlsruhe. Je vais expliquer tout à l'heure un peu sa biographie, mais peut-être euh, tout au début, on laisse aussi un peu la parole euh, un petit mot de bonjour de Philippe Sirène, peut-être qui va aussi nous adresser à un deux mots, peut-être tout au début. Et après, on passera sur la présentation de notre donc, conférencier. Bon, merci. Oui, très rapidement, parce que effectivement, je découvre, enfin, je vous découvre également. Euh, donc, mais je suis très content qu'on que, qu puisse commencer effectivement ce cycle de, donc, je rappelle, de, de quatre conférences dans le cadre de, bah, de, de, des dix ans de coopération entre deux écoles prestigieuses, disons-le, d'architecture, euh, donc Outre-Rhin, euh, puisque l'une est à Karlsruhe, l'autre est à Strasbourg. Voilà. Donc, le choix d'avoir fait un cycle de quatre événements, quatre conférences, deux à Strasbourg, deux à Karlsruhe, les deux étant, les quatre, pardon, étant enregistrés pour pouvoir avoir des transmissions alternées, voilà, etc. Donc, c'est dans, dans ce cadre-là. Merci d'être venu, monsieur Dörz. Dorselman, voilà. j'espère que je n'écorche pas. Et, et je, malheureusement, je ne peux pas vous échanger avec vous en allemand, euh, mais je le regrette. Mais, en anglais, oui. I, I could do that in English, but in French, it's better and easier for me. Um, OK. Donc, je vais laisser la parole aux spécialistes pour euh, <rire> compléter cette présentation. Et voilà. Non, oui, peut-être juste en complément, en cas de conférence, qui viennent aussi euh, dans un moment extrêmement dense de l'année, puisque nous venons à Strasbourg de fêter euh, les 100 ans de l'école. Just school, uh, the birthday for one century of the school in 1921. Mm -hmm. oui. euh, et voilà. Ce, donc on a eu quand même tout un tas d'événements et de conférences. Elle se complète, ce qui explique aussi euh, la difficulté de d'avoir autant de monde qu'on voudrait, et je pense que le fait que ça soit enregistré, que ça soit en anglais, ne facilite pas les choses, mais c'est pas pour autant qu'il n'y a pas l'intérêt de tout le monde, et peut-être un intérêt différé, enfin j'imagine un intérêt différé, voilà. Donc je laisse Dominique terminer. Merci. Donc effectivement, dans ce cadre-là, il y a des quatre conférences, et il y a aussi une exposition, ça je dis aussi, qui aura lieu à partir du 15 juin, ici à l'école d'architecture, sur les dix ans donc de ce double master avec des PFE, qui vont être exposés aussi à Karlsruhe, donc à partir du 12 juillet. Donc c'est un peu ça le cadre aussi de ce cycle de conférences. Alors, je le dis en français, évidemment, il va se présenter... Lui-même aussi pendant sa conférence, euh, aussi à travers ce qu'il fait euh, en termes de son, je dirais, sa biographie. Mais j'ai noté euh, quelques éléments un peu, je dirais, clés. Donc, euh, il est architecte, Maurice Sturstelman. Donc, il a fait son diplôme à l'université de la faculté d'architecture à la RVTH Aachen ou Aix-la-Chapelle. Donc, euh, et il a aussi fait des études à l'école supérieure des arts appliqués de Vienne. Donc, Université der Angewandten Künste Wien, où il a fait la Masterclass de Sarah Hadid et Patrick Schumacher. Donc, c'était un peu euh, donc sa formation initiale. Il a donc continué après, en 2011 jusqu'à 2017, euh, donc euh, être maître conférence associé et euh, aussi chercheur à l'Institut de, alors je l'ai traduit un peu librement parce que c'est en allemand, de construction et de conception numérique. ICD hein, à l'université de Stuttgart. Donc c'est là où il a développé, je crois, une grande partie de ses projets et de ses donc euh, sa recherche qui va nous montrer. Et à partir de 2017, il est donc il était professeur invité à l'université de Munich. Euh, donc pour Engineering Technologies, euh, donc développement des prototypes euh, à l'échelle 1 et aussi euh, effectivement travailler déjà un peu entre recherche et pratique euh, qui lui permettait à fonder donc un bureau d'études qui s'appelle FIPR, hein, GmbH, Fiber, Fiber. Fiber GmbH, euh, qui est donc le transfert de technologie entre donc euh, effectivement le monde numérique et la robotique si on parle, je ne sais pas si on dit euh, roboterie ou roboterie, en, 
robotique, ouais, robotique, pardon, merci, en français, donc euh, la pratique basée sur ce, tout ce qui est numérique. Et depuis 2021, il est donc euh, professeur, euh, donc euh, Tina Trek Professor, ça veut dire une sorte de jeune professeur, si on peut traduire un peu, un peu comme ça, pour uh, Digital Design et Fabrication, et fabrication, ou fabrication à la faculté d'architecture du KIT. Um, il a fait pas mal de workshops, je ne cite pas tout, hein. il a enseigné aussi, fait un workshop à Harvard University, mm -hmm. si j'ai bien vu. Um, donc il, est, il a effectivement aussi euh, donc, euh, voyagé pas mal, il a organisé et réalisé aussi des projets dans le cadre de sa recherche. Par exemple, je notais Research Pavillon avec le ICD et le ITKE, le ITKE, ITKE. Hein? Euh, donc ça c'était à Stuttgart il a fait aussi le euh, Elytra euh, euh, Filament Pavilion et Victoria Albert Museum in London 2016 hein, c'est ça il a fait pour la l'exposition internationale du jardin la Bouga euh, un Fiber Pavilion donc c'était en 2018 et il a fait aussi pour la Daimler Star Arena, Sindelfingen aussi, euh, donc euh, une sorte de structure euh, légère. Donc tout ça, il va vous nous montrer, je suppose. Et euh, je te laisse la parole maintenant en anglais. Et on est très content que tu sois là et qu'on a donc euh, effectivement une euh, sorte de aperçu de ton travail et ta recherche. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Um... Yes, um, as said, I'll switch to English because I don't want to bother you with my French. <laughs> um, yes, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation. Um, it's uh, especially great to be here because we've been working with uh, some students from your school already. So um, although I've not been that long at KIT yet, uh, uh, we already had good experiences with the exchange between our, our schools. Eh? Um, So um, what I'm talking about today is a little bit um, uh, focused on um, uh, the intersections between a practical work and the academic work. Eh? Uh, and uh, uh, interestingly, I did a few, I, I'm working at the intersection of both and I jumped between these a few times, eh? which uh, is a very fruitful uh, intersection, I think, which is uh, Uh, maybe interesting to see in this context. Um, as introduced, uh, I started my academic career at the University of Stuttgart developing um, robotic lightweight uh, construction uh, technologies uh, and uh, followed uh, by a guest professorship at the TU Munich and then a technology transfer to use those technologies actually in practice. Uh, and also here at multiple intersections, not only academia and practice, but also here at the intersection between, let's say, practicing as an architect, but at the same time actually running a fabrication company as a fabricator of the pieces, which is also a very interesting interface. And there are uh, by now a lot of interesting gray zones, and I think the very strict distinctions are kind of getting a little bit blurry, which is a very uh, productive uh, middle ground. And then, as I said recently, since April last year, Um, I have the tenure track professorship for digital design and fabrication at the KIT in Karlsruhe. Um, I'll look a little bit at um, the structures um, I've been uh, investigating for several years in academia and practice, and also see how those were developed at the interface of uh, teaching and practice, yeah? and teaching and research, uh, and um, then look into the structures we're currently investigating in Karlsruhe. And um, maybe a little bit of common topic that those structures I'm exploring uh, are sharing um, uh, is the notion of high resolution structures. Yeah? So um, usually a very fine grain articulated structures are enabled by um, uh, craftsmanship and a lot of effort and time put into it. And I think nowadays we have tools at hand that allow us to operate at that incredible resolution of structures uh, design-wise and then implica uh, implementing them robotically. The big question is how can we utilize that complexity productively uh, and not uh, as an um, purpose uh, per se. So basically this is a ultra high resolution image, let's say, yeah, but <laughs> it's only great pixels. So what are we actually looking at? So complexity per se is not a uh, quality, but an opportunity. And uh, this image shows a little bit what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the very fine articulation of structure, yeah, uh, which allows us to ingrain more information into these structures being structurally, saving materials, integrating additional functions. The topic of high resolution then is also a little bit present in the um, start 
uh, of my academic career, which actually was at the University of Stuttgart, but the first project was in collaboration with the KIT already, because we were investigating those biological lightweight structures, and the imaging methods for that were present at KIT. Actually, at the Campus North, with the Helmholtz uh, Institutes, uh, we had a huge uh, particle accelerator that was used to investigate those beetles. So I was talking about high resolution of our architectural structures, but it all actually started with high resolution imagery of biological structures. And why is that interesting? Um, uh, not because we want to build the beetle, but because certain features of this beetle are ultra strong, ultra light, and in nature there's a certain evolutionary pressure to be very cautious about how you use your resources. And that's a very, very relevant question for how we build structures uh, uh, nowadays. And um, that was basically the particle accelerator I was talking about. So we had this very small beetle in a huge machine uh, and got this ultra high resolution imagery. And there's a lot of features. One is that are interesting in terms of functional integration, but that we actually don't want to transfer. Yeah? So now we're already at, let's say, a classical architect's job yeah? to uh, working at the cross-section of multiple disciplines and putting everything together into a holistic whole, which means working with biologists, working with imaging specialists to then transfer that into a lightweight structure. And I think that's also a good analogy to classical architectural work, where you need to interface a lot of various disciplines coming together in a building. We went very much into the depth here, and I think the base of the structures um, uh, that um, I'm in implementing with different materials and different techniques is always a certain linearity and anisotropy in the materials that we're using. Uh, that's a basic principle in nature. All load-bearing structures in nature are uh, fiber composite materials. Uh, so we have um, collagen fibers in our connective tissue, but also in the tendons. Yeah? They have very different structural properties. It's just aligned differently. And if we gain control through computational design processes and robotic fabrication about those uh, material organization yeah, in that resolution, then we can really tailor the material properties we're looking at. So what we did is we translated the, print, the structural principles of a biological lightweight structure into a technical lightweight structure that can be used uh, for construction. Again, through a certain lens of simplification and breaking it down to certain rules, there's a certain sequence in which we're applying those linear elements and they reciprocally deform each other. And the form here is emerging through the process of laying those fibers uh, on top of each other. Uh, there are certain geometrical principles that can be simplified. Um, and that is then, again, very much an architect's job yeah, at the interface with, for example, in biologists. So there's one general notion that's maybe interesting already in the context of uh, teaching and research. It's uh, interdisciplinarity yeah, that we're working and bringing so much knowledge uh, together. Um, the next aspect um, is also covering that, for example, which sort of machine setup do we need to implement these structures? Yeah? And if you're working as an architectural student on this uh, uh, you might quickly find yourself in a territory where you're not that comfortable and not that knowledgeable, but there are very interesting um, interrelations between decisions you're taking during the tool design that then actually implement uh, or have an impact on the solution space that you can explore as an architect. Yeah? So that basically, while this looks like a very technical machine construction uh, work, this is actually super design relevant because each decision here is reflected in certain design opportunities that you can or cannot explore later uh, in your work. And um, what is uh, very suitable to navigate those um, uh, interrelations and interdependencies between all of these topics of uh, the, the machine working space, uh, the material behavior um, and the material arrangement are computational design methods, which actually allow ourselves to negotiate all of these interrelations. Yeah? So um, the idea here uh, that we um, were pursuing at the University of Stuttgart is um, uh, negotiating all those interrelations and then uh, finding a solution that you would not actually draw up by hand, yeah? um, but which is still based on basic principles that are well understandable. Um, so basically, um, we can ingrain simple rules into the system that then emerges into a more complex outcome. And we can also do that on the next level, where uh, we are then algorithmically describing in which sequence those uh, connections uh, are made and placed by the robot to achieve a certain geometry that we want to see. So here we see how this parabola is emerging from the interaction of all of these lines. Yeah? Um, 
So this was the setup we used for that. And um, oh, unfortunately, today is everything cursed. The videos are also not running. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. So basically what you see is there's a fiber source. So this is a, a string which is still soft, right? And the robots are making a coordinated movement to place these in certain areas where we need reinforcement in the structure. And that allows us to tap into a repertoire uh, which actually is uh, uh, the, the serial production of unique parts. Eh? Each geometry, p geometrical piece here is different, each fiber layout is unique in these structures, which is taking lightweight construction principles that we observed in nature and transferring it into architecture. The question later will be, and we'll discuss it through the lecture, how much do we want to push this complexity and how do we negotiate that with architectural relevance in terms of uh, can we apply it in our structures? And where do we transition from basic research into our tools that we're going to use and explore? And how much does it become applied research in terms of um, architectural ap applicability? Uh, for now, it was the first project that we implemented um, uh, in this technique together with our students. So that's then, again, the intersection to teaching. Those are not just purely research projects, but they were executed um, through our design studios together with the students, uh, which was a very rich, rich exchange um, at the intersection between research and teaching uh, with students from different disciplines working together and uh, students and researchers really collaborating on a research uh, topic. And that allowed us to really uh, push the boundaries here in terms of um, building technology. But at the same time, that also allows us to explore a novel design and construction repertoire that's emerging from those materials and te techniques that we're using. So that I was explaining now the first project and then I went on for several years at the University of Stuttgart to explore more and more interesting uh, techniques that um, were refining, uh, the, always pushing a little bit the uh, um, technological boundaries. So one repertoire that we also tapped into was more like a behavioral fabrication where we were uh, uh, not having a top-down instruction to the robot, but where the robot would more operate like a fabrication agent that would use sensors to sense its environment and respond accordingly. So the fiber layout of the pavilion was not pre-designed, but emerging through the fabrication. Yeah? Um, here with a pneumatic formwork and then a, a shell that was gradually stiffened. And again, that also allowed us to explore the architectural features that were emerging from that. But then the question was, where do we reach a, a saturation curve in terms of technological complexity? Yeah? And how does it actually then, where is the transfer into your practical application or what's the architectural relevance? And that's basically on a very um, high flying level societal relevance. Yeah? So one point is clear, okay, we're saving resources through lightweight construction. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's also which types of resources do we use um, and how can we uh, design components for uh, reuse and um, uh, circularity. So uh, we addressed that uh, in um, the last project that I did as a researcher at the university uh, in London, um, where we had the opportunity to work within existing context. Yeah? That's already one step further than making a research pavilion which stands for itself. So there's more of an, um, a contextualization and that's relevant for architecture nowadays because we're mostly working in existing context. Uh, we had the idea of the minimal invasive building site, which meant we had small light components that would fit through the tiny door of the museum and were installed uh, here in the courtyard. At the same time, we were exploring the idea of local fabrication, saying we bring a uh, machine, which is actually quite small when it's in transport mode, and the fibers on the spool in there into the courtyard, and then fabricate pieces here that would extend the um, structure. Uh, so logistically, a little bit more careful about not shipping huge volumes of air around. Um, and actually, the whole idea of reconfiguration and uh, reusability of components is a very relevant one nowadays also, which is always a balance between uh, the project that I showed before, the very bespoke, yeah? this component only fits into this corner of that particular structure versus a structure that is negotiating the optimization of lightweight structures versus the reusability and reconfigurability of components. So there's a little bit more complexity in here, which in the end 
uh, doesn't actually make it more complex, but actually a little bit more simpler. Because we then said, okay, we can simplify the outline of these components, so they all have an interface where they fit, but then within the components, the complexity unfolds. But also that we constrained to certain types, so we knew which one could be added where and uh, re reconfigured. Um, the canopy also had certain um, uh, climatic performances and was also not a structure just for itself, but was more working with how do people um, occupy um, uh, the space. And um, here we see those components, which then on the local level have integration of connection detailing uh, that really utilize the complexity and the high resolution of these structures in a, a constructive uh, way. Um, but then we're simplifying the interface and how those structures um, can be used. Interface to steel columns, uh, interface to uh, facade on the roof, uh, and uh, also for the first time an economy of scale yeah? where we could not only see okay we do it at the interface of research and teaching and it takes a lot of time to make each component but for the first time we saw okay well that's actually a, val uh, um, a valid construction technology because we can produce these at reasonable times and scale and that could also work as a construction system um, and uh, from there on, we proved that it works to reconfigure and move it. It was as first at Vitra and Valem Rhine and then in, uh, in Shanghai. Um, but generally the project or the whole line of research up to this project was really laying the base and the foundation for then uh, uh, implementing these uh, structures at scale. So that was a very interesting uh, journey uh, from teaching two larger third-party funded research projects, and then looking into the technology transfer because the structures were relevant, uh, the technology was well developed enough, uh, and based on these architectural objects, we had also clients asking and being interested in these structures, while at the same time, uh, the methods had been refined for its operation. That's when we started our company and uh, said um, that we actually want to take this to the market. Um, which I think also in the context of um, uh, um, applied technology, teaching, research is very interesting to showcase those entrepreneurial opportunities to our students and researchers. Yeah? That um, often if building, technology, if building companies are a little bit slow in adopting novel technologies, yeah? then it's a huge opportunity for researchers and students to actually step into the market and say, well, we can do this ourselves. Yeah? Um, and the, the, the capabilities of ar architects are so wide that actually managing a company also fits very well into the job profile of an architect. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, so what we're doing at um, Fiber, ah, that's very sad, this video also doesn't work. Um, so what we're doing at Fiber is we explore structures that are very robust. Uh, we are um, uh, working um, uh, very much with digital tools um, in a loop and vertically integrated, meaning that we can support uh, projects very early on. Yeah? Either we design our own uh, when we get approached by the client directly, or we uh, provide design assist services to large architectural offices to uh, interface with them and help them to make best use of our technologies. Then we can go all the way to um, design, plan, certify these structures and uh, fabricate and install them. Uh, so um, what we're utilizing is a material efficient on multiple levels. So one, it's additive fabrication, right? So uh, we only place material where it is required. That already saves a lot of material and is again back the notion of the very high resolution structure. Uh, everything where you can see through is basically saved material. Huh? Uh, versus subtractive methods where you would then maybe make the piece lighter in the end, but you wasted the material on the way, and here we just added locally. Um, at the same time, we're saving a lot in tooling, usually in composite technology. That curve here would be inscribed in the tooling underneath. Now that geometry is inscribed in the sequence how we place the fibers, which is the robot code. Yeah? So that has a lot of flexibility that we can, even on the same tool, produce a variety of uh, component geometries just by varying the uh, robot code. Um, and we have a very simplified tool where we only have these pins which are fixed in place and need a certain precision to join with other tools and the rest here is a little bit flexible. So we work with the basic principles of prefabrication, so those are light, precise components we, which we can bring to site. 
uh, which we can interface very quickly. Uh, there's uh, not a lot of noise, not a lot of dirt on the building side. It's a quick, minimal invasive building site. We're exploring the expressive materiality of these structures uh, at the same time. And we are exploring um, functional integration, uh, which is enabled by these structures, um, like integrating structural details, uh, even integrating uh, sensors or greenery uh, into these structures. And we can obviously uh, vary within the family of components. So one project uh, that uh, was mentioned in the introduction uh, that I want to talk about is very special for me, because that marked the transition between academia and practice. I was actually designing that project, being a researcher at university, and then my company was uh, Im implementing and actually setting it up um, on site. So obviously we work with classical geometrical uh, models, but uh, more importantly, uh, there's uh, this information network uh, behind, which then feeds into our fabrication logic, where only a very small limited set of laser cut parts can be varied and adjusted to then uh, facilitate the fabrication of all those varied uh, components. And then the core know-how of our company is actually um, uh, ingrained in these tools where we, uh, no one can draw a thousand lines of fibers by himself. Yeah? And uh, obviously um, uh, this is done uh, with a computer based on this before mentioned negotiation of a lot of various aspects and information that need to flow together here. Interesting part is that we directly get the robot code as well. Yeah? So uh, basically while we change something on the fiber layout based on information probably we get from the structural engineers as an, as an example, we always have the updated, updated uh, robot code um, as well. Uh, which then goes into fabrication, where we um, fabricate the components, they get tempered, taken off the frame, and then uh, while these fibers are soft and malleable, these are very hard and stable. Uh, we install them uh, on site, we can pre-assemble huge uh, chunks of the structure. And the project also showcased how this is again not only an innovation in lightweight construction, but is also exploring a new design and expressive um, uh, repertoire with all those uh, the high resolution components, then reflecting also in very fine articulated shadows uh, and um, this fibrous character of the structure. So these are six meter long components, which you can easily carry with two people. Uh, they withstand uh, 28 tons in compression, so that means they're even more capable than other uh, loading scenarios. It's a 22 meter span, a CF7 meters high, 400 square meters of a space. And most importantly, this was fully certified as a building in public space. Yeah? which is a big topic bringing novel construction um, uh, innovation into the market is how do you actually get it certified. Yeah? Um, so there's a lot of things that we can explore uh, in um, academia, but then w what this allows me is to reflect that back into what we do at our company is how do we, how do we actually bring those components into the market. So now talking about this intersection between academia uh, and um, uh, practice or teaching and uh, and practice um, that helps a lot when we now explore components with our students that we can see the route how this becomes relevant yeah we can always cross check it against our practical um, uh, references um, we were then uh, commissioned by Daimler uh, to uh, uh, make a very big um, ins installation huge wall if you want to call it like that so here the most secret prototypes are driven here and presented to the board. Uh, it's a very complex geometry, doubly curved in, in all directions, uh, 12 meters high. So there's a huge wind force levering on this. Uh, and uh, we used again our capability to work with geometry to go from one meter 80 deep down here to 40 centimeter thin up there. Uh, and each component had a unique geometry and a unique fiber layout. Uh, where we had a lot of variation in the robot code, but only very simple tools that we could adjust to facilitate the various geometries in terms of hardware that we need to fabricate this. Uh, here are all the different variations of that frame. Uh, one topic we had to push here is quality assurance. Yeah? Daimler was very critical about that and we had to document everything, uh, which also then helped us a lot to develop our company. And that was the first project where we did the certification in-house, yeah? where we did not pay a lot of fees to do it externally, and where which allows us, so we were building our engineering team, so by now we have aerospace engineers and mechanical engineers employed in our company. Again, uh, 
uh, fostering this um, interdisciplinarity, not only teaching research, but also in our company. And um, interesting part here is when we have the testing facilities and capabilities in our, uh, in our own uh, fabrication company, uh, that does not only save money in terms of uh, making expensive tests as a, as a material testing institute, but most importantly, that allows us to make very quick iterations of prototypes. Yeah? Make the first component, uh, purposefully underdimension it, and see where it fails and how it fails, and that helps you a lot to then save material in the further optimization and uh, calibrate the structural models. Um, so this level of um, high resolution articulation then saves a lot of material, yeah? but also then has a very interesting spatial articulation in terms of the multi-layeredness of these uh, structures. Uh, and uh, from the front we have a rather flat surface, which has a very interesting light dynamic here. If you walk across, there's always a different line is uh, reflecting the sun. And from the back you have this geometrical depth of the structure, uh, which um, is really interesting uh, uh, spatially. So it's uh, a very impressive structure. Unfortunately, in the most secret area of the Daimler Development Center, <laughs> which means no one is going to see it ever except the Daimler board and some engineers. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I was actually, and that's also an interesting, interesting part here. Uh, I was actually on site with my team putting this together. So um, I'm certified to drive all sorts of construction equipment. And uh, that is also part of the fun of having a construction company as an architect, that you're not just sitting on the drawing board, but you're actually 12 meters up there putting it together is uh, better than going on vacation, actually. <laughs> Yeah, uh, here you can see how it's tapering, yeah, here how, from very wide to very uh, thin um, up there. Good, um, uh, Renzo Piano building in the, in the background. Um, the next development uh, that we were facing here, so uh, how can this complexity actually be brought back and reflected back again into something that's more applicable? And that's something where we worked with the university again. Uh, so um, uh, the professors I used to work with at the university before were invited uh, for uh, the um, Biennale in Venice and we were the uh, um, industry and development partner to implement this together. Um, what we did here is the wood fiber hybrid structure. Yeah? So looking into those wood panels and how can they interface with the fiber suspension, if you want to call it like that. So going away from the singular research focused structure, which is only the fibers and looking more into the interfaces with other structures. And then also actually scaling back also on the complexity of these structures again a bit in terms of reconfigurability. Uh, you can walk on that structures and that could be scaled into larger components that might be inhabitable. Yeah? So we fabricated that in our company, that's before the components were shipped. Very interesting logistics also again to be managed uh, by our team uh, in Venice <laughs> and then uh, putting it together in the existing building and that showcased again how this uh, term with the uh, minimal invasive building site actually works quite well in the historic context with tiny doors. Uh, it helps a lot to have those very stiff and stable but very light components um, to work with. And again, in the end, uh, all the technical advancements that are in here are then reflected again in a very uh, um, highly articulated um, space. Uh, so that was very successful and also um, uh, interesting because the project was again developed together with students, together with the university, together with researchers, together with our company and really crossing ac across the whole board from research, teaching and practice. Um, another facet uh, how we are exploring these structures and how they can be differentiated is not only structurally but also for example how we can use them as varied shading uh, structures. And that is a topic which is relevant for our company because it's um, about scaling. Yeah? That's about the economy of scale. And the first building where it's not some sort of an exhibition piece or pavilion, but this is permanently weathered uh, structure. So it's 1,800 square meters of, of facade. Uh, and we did that together with um, uh, Alman Wappner uh, architects uh, and Professor Menges and Professor uh, Knippers. Uh, where we had to uh, do all the checks again, uh, fire, weathering, structure, getting it certified, coming even up 
with our team with the methods how to test it, how can we use a lot of pneumatic balloons to get a more distributed surface load to simulate the wind load on these uh, structures, uh, and then um, working with the SBI tests to get it uh, the fire rating and get the structural rating for these components and certify this as a permanent building system. Um, we had one frame on which we could then, with various robot codes, uh, build all of these different components that have a different fiber layout, depending on how the structures, uh, the structural requirements are, and different glass fiber density, depending on the shading requirement requirements for um, the building. So that's one of these components, uh, three meter eighty edge. So this is pretty much one to one, maybe, <laughs> and uh, that's how it's currently on site, uh, coming together. And um, it's a big step uh, for our company to implement that at that scale in a permanent structure. And um, what is interesting about starting a company um, uh, yourself um, is how you approach it. A lot of people go, go out there and are more uh, concerned with their pitch to acquire funding yeah, rather than actually sitting down and learning through the project. And we decided to start a company the hard way which means initially that was our company, yeah? <laughs> There's like, <laughs> the robot is nearly falling through the ceiling and the room is actually not high enough, yeah? uh, And then uh, a few years later, that was our company and now it looks like, like this and everything is exploding and too small and we need a larger hall. We now have 25 employees working in Stuttgart uh, on these sort of uh, uh, structures. And that has been a very um, amazing journey, which I now bring back into my teaching in Karlsruhe. Yeah? So there's a practical experience as an architectural entrepreneur and uh, now the technology transfer is something uh, that we want to support through our teaching. Obviously the structures we are currently developing in Karlsruhe are first test balloons, yeah? uh, but um, when we develop that further we for sure want to um, uh, uh, establish a culture where our researchers, where our students can take on the opportunities and uh, start something. Uh, for me, that was hard enough. I'm probably not doing it again, but we want to uh, present a platform for others to do so and maybe uh, a company that process a little bit. So, so back to where we started, the beetle. So are we not yet at the beetle qualities? No, we are not because the beetle is working in a food uh, network and obviously circular. Yeah? Uh, the structures that uh, we presented uh, so far uh, not circular, but there is a huge opportunity to develop that, what we're currently focusing, because aligning those anisotropic linear structures in a very high resolution with the robot works with all sorts of materials. And we are then again, uh, we're collaborating with the university to develop that into a structure that is made from flux fiber. Yeah? The idea of using fast regrowing resources that can be harvested and used into those uh, high resolution structures first developing the whole machinery and tooling for this again, then fabricating these components in our company, uh, combining various materials together here to make it work, produce quite large components, and then our team putting it together on site in Freiburg in the Botanical Garden into this uh, structure, which has a little bit a different material expression. So it's a little bit more denser. Yeah? The, the, it's, it's not this high-tech, cold glass carbon fiber structure. I think it has a very different warmer appearance, which is, uh, which is nice, but at the same time maintains the porosity and lightness of the structures uh, uh, that we are um, uh, building. And that is definitely something which sparked a lot of interest with our clients and currently quite a few of the projects we're developing at the company are planned in biocomposite materials. Um, exactly. Also in permanent uh, applications, oh, I took that out. Um, no, now in the context of this lecture, uh, focusing more on, again, practice and um, mm. teaching. So this is a master thesis at the University of Stuttgart, the master program where I used to teach for quite a while. And actually those two students went on to become uh, computational designers in our company. Yeah? So that's also one intersection between research and teaching is that yes, you can explore these things together and you can bring ideas from your practice into the teaching, but the other way around, you also um, open up opportunities uh, for these skills to then be employed in practice because uh, that's a little bit like the student's dream come true. Uh, you develop a master thesis, 
then you can actually employ these skills one to one in a company where this now becomes a product and is developed further. So basically the kind of still working on the thesis but uh, uh, together with us uh, in the company so that the model that they built at the time how that can be a slab uh, a ceiling uh, structure. Now we have a Zukunft Bau supported project where in Berlin we will first fabricate a few components of that uh, with our company and then based on the knowledge we gained through the Biennale structure with the wood fiber hybrid systems and now transferring that into uh, more natural biocomposite materials could become or we have some projects in the pipeline where this can be a very interesting construction system natural fibers with wood combined. Um, Again, uh, uh, do we address the larger goals that we discussed initially? Yes, we, we do, I think. Uh, uh, we are working with the materials more towards circular um, uh, um, alternatives. We are working towards um, uh, structures uh, that are very light and safe materials, but on the same time working in the company narrows it down into uh, your getting deeper and deeper into one corner of the problem. Yeah? And I think the huge opportunity that now opens up with uh, this exchange between having a professorship and the practice means that you can operate in a much larger, larger field. So let's say that's the knowledge graph for now. Yeah? We were then assembling a very interdisciplinary team at our company uh, where we have aerospace engineers, um, textile engineers, mechanical engineers, um, architects, all of it mixed. That expands that knowledge graph a little bit. But we're still a company that started very much in the realm of research and now is going into the commercial uh, practice side. And currently, last year we doubled the company. This year is also looking very good. So where the company has to go to first have an impact in the market and secondly to economically uh, be stable is this direction. Yeah? While a lot of ideas that we currently think through, how can we address circularity in construction also in a larger interdisciplinary context, those questions are actually solved up there. Yeah? And I can't go there because it's just too expensive for me as a company to do so, right? So that's now the amazing opportunity that opens up if where uh, we actually um, now have a research team and the company, which is very strictly uh, detached in terms of budgets, yeah? one is public research service and one is my private company, but there is this interesting overlap between research and teaching. Yeah? Basically we're working on applied research and research oriented practice yeah? and this is really much influencing each other and while those are two separate entities, obviously in my mind those things are kind of blending together and there's a huge benefit from each other. Um, now we have the university team and the fiber team but we are still missing a lot of uh, information depth here to actually tackle the problem. And that's where now the huge network of the KIT comes in, yeah? uh, where we say that, yes, architectural research is always happening at the intersection of design and technology. But now being in this vast network of interdisciplinary work at KIT actually allows us to then also go in depth into production processes, informatics, robotics, it's all of it there. Um, obviously, you know a bit of that as a self-taught architect, but actually working with the expert is a different thing. Energy and material cycles, all of these uh, can really tap uh, in here, and then we get the full knowledge depth across the board. Uh, now, um, a little bit, what did we do so far in our professorship? So it's only since about a year, yeah? but uh, it's been a very cool journey uh, so far. Uh, and as I said, we've been also working with your students successfully um, already, so that interface works. So first we assembled an interdisciplinary team here also. So fine arts, um, mechanical engineering, uh, and there's a new engineering position also coming up, and the rest are architects, so we try to mix it up also in our team. And what we're actually addressing is a larger question of how can we use digital technologies to reinvent a circularity that we saw in historical structures already. What I mentioned earlier a little bit like, yes, you can have those articulated structure to craftsmanship, yeah, but how can that be scaled into applications where currently just the, let's say, simple industrialization of fabrication processes was oversimplifying our structures and didn't allow us this level of um, uh, detailing. And also here, at the time just bound to local materials that uh, currently are only able to be used also with very limited uh, craftsmanship and knowledge available. Um, 
and how can that be used? So what we're looking at is um, uh, a natural composite of fast regrowing materials. Currently, we're investigating willows, yeah? and we investigate. We established a connection with someone who's growing them at the Rhine in Karlsruhe. Uh, so we have a very local source of that material and of the soil as well. And what uh, in classical uh, structures here is used as a 2D infill. We're developing that into a three-dimensional structure that can be stable by itself, actually saving this lumber and only working with this. Yeah? Um, so how do we do that? Again, we tap into this vast repertoire of knowledge at, 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 at the faculty. So my team is developing digital methods to implement these structures, while then others bring the knowledge of classical building construction to the table, while um, others bring knowledge about materiality and how do we need to design for reassembly uh, and recycling, then classical structural uh, engineering know-how that goes into that. Then uh, we have um, a, a very big testing facility, yeah, which is actually testing components at one-to-one -one scale. Again, the interface, I, I had an amazing uh, meeting with Professor Deitch uh, just because there is an interface, because we had these testing and certification of our structures in the company already, and we kind of had a common ground to talk about, so that's how practice and research then have a good interface again. And then going all the way to actually looking into the environmental impact of those uh, uh, structures that we're designing and um, uh, th uh, making LC8 structures. So uh, we have a larger research grant acquired also between five professorships at KIT and uh, our company, so that was interesting because uh, that was actually very much also uh, supported by the KIT as long as there's like a clear separation between who does uh, what. So then also the synergy between academia and practice again, even in that research uh, project. And what we're doing is we are allowed to implement uh, a series of research demonstrators at the Buga in uh, Mannheim, uh, where we are building a larger um, flux fiber roof and then more, uh, which is state of the art, what we can offer from our company and also certified as a public building. And then around that we have um, in so-called innovation satellites where we see how far can we push our uh, 3D willow braiding technology. Uh, the topic that unites both of them is that it's fast regrowing resources that can be used in construction. So it's not uh, what we currently see on the, on the timber market um, uh, that uh, there's a little bit the market uh, and market demand and how long it takes to grow the trees and uh, the amount of energy that goes into then um, standardizing the wood into a, a industrial uh, material yeah? uh, rather than taking the willow as cut from the tree uh, and uh, working with the, let's say, inaccuracies of the material through digital technologies, which enables us to w compensate for that and work with that. So here again, our innovation pipeline, we're going from research-oriented teaching to explorative prototyping, then acquire third-party funding, then uh, build larger scale demonstrators to show that it works, and then after the fact, uh, uh, um, retrospectively justify all that research by actually bringing it uh, to the market. That's an ambition for now for our work at KIT, but we are kind of somewhere in between here currently. So we're on track. <laughs> Um, another interesting thing is that um, usually a W1 tenure track uh, or junior professorship has a very small research focus, yeah? uh, but the professorship we have in, uh, at the KIT is actually um, uh, uh, representing the field in the full width, yeah? which uh, for example allows us to completely reshape the curriculum for the first semesters in the bachelor, so full first semester, third semester, uh, second semester bachelor going from classical architectural geometry to uh, initial exploration in digital design uh, and at the end of the first semester of the architecture studies each student was modeling laser cutting uh, 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 one cell of this uh, wall so very early on um, in um, uh, confronting them with digital design technologies and teach the field of architectural geometry through digital digital means then uh, jumping in the second semester, um, having uh, teaching integrative digital methods, which are focused on swapping between analog and digital. So from model making to digitizing that, to then printing it again, to uh, um, 
various technologies with always bridge between the analog and the digital back and forth as a toolkit for them to work with. In the third semester, it will be more about explorative digital design techniques. Um, so how do we then uh, do our explorative teaching on the master level? So we're looking again into circular material flows. And uh, what we're doing is we're having our design studio, which is uh, teaching. We have in parallel our third party funded projects and then we have our milestones where we are actually allowed to showcase that on one to one scale. Recently we got invited to the Dutch Design Week where we also show like a, a six meter tower that we can build. So looking into the biological cycle of materials. We had uh, a studio um, that Thibault actually made a very uh, good contribution to where we go from individual investigations and then narrow it down to a group work into one project that we want to implement. Uh, and uh, we were actually exploring a whole wealth of ideas of how one can use those simple, uh, not stable uh, willow branches, but by combining them three-dimensionally, making it into a stiff structure. Uh, that was a, a very interesting repertoire that we were exploring there, but obviously then also backing it up with digital technologies to manage that complexity. Uh, understanding the force flow in such a beam, yeah, where does the willow actually want to lay, and what are the parameters and technologies we can use to manage that uh, uh, material. So here, for example, the machine placing uh, uh, the willow uh, to, for example, make a beam and then reflecting it back into architectural designs as well. Yeah? So it's very important that we are not only looking at this in terms of uh, uh, design and fabrication technologies, but then also reflect how an architectural space made with these structures could um, uh, look like. Uh, then uh, something that we discussed while entering the building, because you have this impressive foyer and uh, it's a very nice exhibition space and we try to actually showcase and um, exhibit our work regularly. So we had a very uh, nice exhibition of that work also in the, in, in the foyer, uh, which is as a space not as impressive as your foyer here, but at least it provides a platform where you can communicate with nearly everyone who's entering the building. And we were showcasing what we did in that semester uh, uh, with, uh, with our students, um, including some of the reflections how that could like look like architecturally. The technical cycle, looking into metals that can be infinitely recycled using the urban mine to make lightweight steel structures, taking the idea of uh, taking the urban mine and then uh, turning it into lighter structures by considering steel more in a textile way. Yeah? So um, usually it's the hard steel, but using it in a textile has a very interesting background because textile technologies, they have the high resolution aspect to it and variations of these structures uh, allow this level of uh, differentiation but they also have the history of being the first machines that could be automized, uh, that then allows currently various products to have integrated features uh, like that, that might also be interesting to explore in our structures. So we had like a few uh, concepts implemented by uh, students from the design to actually uh, making it. We were then uh, dip buff galvanizing these, and then we had some sort of a composite structure, again, metal, metal composite that was uh, stable, exploring uh, different weaving parameters for steel, for example, and how that could then unfold in a prototype uh, or braiding technologies that unfolded into this small tower-like column uh, uh, component um, as one of the explorations, for example, that we do um, uh, with our students. Um, as I said, we will have the opportunity to showcase some of that uh, in larger one-to-one -one, uh, structures. And um, yes, uh, as I said, uh, Thibault was contributing to our structures. Currently, Alicia, one of your students, is taking uh, our studio. And that's why I can only um, advertise our classes. And uh, we are very satisfied with the performance of our uh, Strasbourg students. So uh, uh, come as many as you, as, as you want and, and, and visit our classes. Uh, and we want to build on that exchange. And maybe we, we can also get a connection more on the research uh, level. And now I'm pretty new in Karlsruhe but it's, it's nice to already get the chance to visit here and um, I think we can build on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question mm -hmm. that I wanted to do yesterday and I couldn't, and I couldn't do. Uh, uh, many of the... Of the Yeah. 
talk very loud. Many of the of the of the images you show and all the process you show uh, is for me a way to gain control on things you do. You test your structures. You you try to to reduce the material. You have like a, a huge amount of control somehow. But at the same time, the structures look like so expressive that they're expecting some some unexpected mm -hmm. situations. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm interested in the life of those of those uh, of those structures and how they interact with the unexpected. Because we discussed a little bit uh, in your study about the birds coming in London. Yeah. But how 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 these structures interact with the human, non-human, and, and maybe with the green, or I don't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think the question has different levels to it. One of it is, um, obviously, we're going from an early um, uh, explorative prototyping phase uh, that we do in the context of teaching, where a lot of unexpected things happen. Yeah? It's, it's, it's a very great playground to make smaller concept models and play around and have this big repertoire. Because then, it's as you say, it's a lot of effort to then gain control and understanding of what is actually happening, yeah? uh, which you need to a certain degree to then employ it in larger um, uh, uh, structures. But there is this, um, uh, we're actually fostering this situation where you say, okay, th 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 this unexpectedness is supposed to happen uh, when we play with the material in our studio. Um, and that um, unexpected exploration also happens through computational design methods which also is a great tool to come up with not preconceived ideas yeah? where um, uh, often like your normal uh, pen and paper thinking is a pretty straightforward top-down thinking often yeah? and uh, through computational design um, you can play more with the parameters and suddenly explore or, or, or actually not just play with the parameters that's still a top-down thing just with a different tool but use different computational design paradigms uh, uh, which are more explorative in their uh, nature to come up with uh, solutions that you, you probably wouldn't think of. Um, then um, uh, other things that you mentioned in terms of uh, later what happens when you employ these structures when you uh, gain control of these and what's the unexpectedness that um, uh, uh, happens maybe you mentioned it like it's uh, through the let's say uh, pseudo biological appearance of this carbon fiber structures the birds were coming and nesting in there because it felt so natural to them to inhabit that yeah? <laughs> and um, another aspect that you mentioned is but that was actually very controlled was, was um, how it interacts with plants so while I was um, uh, um, uh, teaching in uh, in Munich, uh, I was working um, together with Ferdinand Ludwig and uh, Thomas Auer, um, and um, Ferdinand Ludwig is exploring the use of grown biological structures, actually uh, bau botanic building with trees or using trees in architecture in, in various ways. And uh, where we saw an interesting interface between our work is how uh, can uh, climbing plants inhabit our structures? Yeah? And what we, where we did some research on is how uh, do uh, various climbing plants, they have different climbing mechanisms, some are like wedging themselves in with their spikes, uh, and some have this spiraling movement. Um, and depending on which one you work with, uh, we can actually vary the mesh density of our structures uh, and basically inscri inscribe the plant growth through our computation design as an instruction to the robot who's fabricating the structure. Uh, and then we see how the plants are inhabiting uh, uh, these. And currently, actually, uh, one structure that we realized at the time is still uh, um, with the uh, Botany Institute in, um, in Munich, where different plants are growing on it. And they're checking every year if it actually plays out how we simulated it. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah can I have okay. yeah. Yeah, a question about, <clears throat> let's say, the way of working. I'll go back 70 years to high auto mm -hmm. hanging roofs mm -hmm. and all this generation of engineers exploring new, new materials also. Yeah. And, uh, and then you will have this project in Mannheim where you have the multi hall. So, how do you see those pioneers and what, what were their possibilities in their work and what we are doing, what is possible now? Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, I think um, uh, the thinking behind is um, often quite similar. We're basically extending that with our tools that we have nowadays. It's much easier nowadays to design and uh, fabricate these structures than um, at the time, obviously. But um, uh, what is uh, maybe also a little bit different is um, how uh, we are turning more... Um, so we start with this very expressive structures, yeah? but the tendency currently um, in the research um, in, in Karlsruhe, but also in our company, is to come up with a more relevant building components. So what we are starting to look at is, um, uh, we are, let's say there's a phase where you're interested in the geometric complexity and how you can control it as a research in itself. Yeah? But uh, shells then actually didn't become a mainstream architectural typology for certain reasons. Yeah? So that's why we will look much more into uh, slabs and columns and uh, uh, maybe um, seeing these not as very strict categories and see how they can hybridize and work together a little bit, but not pushing or not rejecting these type of uh, component categorization and saying, no, now everything is one big freeform block because we can do it, right? Uh, and I think that's a little bit maybe a difference, how we use the complex tools to then in the end maybe come up with very simple building components. Yeah? that still make a lot of sense in terms of materials used, material cycles, uh, material savings, reusability, handling of these components. So we can use complex tools to make also simple but relevant building components. Yeah. My second question, if I might, would be what are the experiences with, uh, let's say, stability, stability needs to time, like UV, you know, such kind of problems, that might appear. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, maybe very two separate realms. Uh, one, uh, with the natural building materials we're currently exploring uh, with my team in Karlsruhe, obviously we can draw a lot on historic examples. Yeah? And there's, there's very established design guidelines of, okay, you need to keep a little distance from the ground, uh, you need to uh, protect it from direct water, you need to break the speed of water rinsing down, and that's uh, very, let's say, very rich uh, um, repertoire between craftsmanship and architectural design uh, that we actually tap into. We um, visited a lot of people that have their, let's say, uh, handcraft knowledge in uh, um, uh, earth wall structures or willow braiding and then try to transfer and inscribe that knowledge in our digital tools. Yeah? Um, and uh, in the end, that's basically integration of classical um, uh, uh, building or construction detailing into our digital fabrication and using this functional integration in terms of uh, having integrated connection details that can be also fabricated by the machine. Um, and um, the other aspect with the fiber composite structures um, at our company, uh, we obviously had to invest a lot of work into it because that was initially in the research at the university, not the main focus. It was more about the design and fabrication tools. And now as a company, uh, we, we need to give warranties on these structures, right? Uh, and uh, that means that, for example, for the facade that is currently built in, um, in Reutlingen, um, that's a permanent building facade. Uh, so we had about one and a half years in advance where we had various material samples uh, at the Textile Institute in weathering chambers with hard UV radiation, temperature up and down, ice on the structure and, and all, of, all of that. And we had a very good collaboration there with um, uh, 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 Covesco uh, developing actually materials. So there's a, let's say, quite a bespoke formula of our material that we currently use which a little bit like a USP that different other composite fabricators might not be able to employ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. It was really very, very interesting. Um, I'd like to make a comment and, and ask a question. Comment, I think it's interesting the, the issue of expression because I have to say some of your structures are terrifying. <laughs> and that's, I don't mean that as a joke, but really just, I thought it very interesting because on one hand, the, the, the massive scaling of structures that are being drawn from, for example, an insect uh, world, 
it sends my whole body messages that there's a giant insect nearby waiting to eat. <laughs> and so I, I am kind of curious, maybe later when we're having a drink, if you can, if you had anybody terrified. Um, but I am really fascinated by something you talked about in terms of the tool design. Because I think, uh, you know, we, we speak, we spend so much time thinking about the object, the product uh, of the process. We are advancing in our thinking as makers and thinking about the process uh, of design. But this concept of tool design and how it impacts the possibilities for the design space, mm -hmm. I think is something that's underexplored. And uh, I, I'm really interested if you have at, at least some experiences that you could share with us about how you've seen that develop. Yeah. <laughs> so two things. Um, obviously, the, um, the first pavilion that I showed was actually pretty close to the beetle, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I think that's interesting because it's also a little bit challenging design aesthetics and really allowing the emergence of these design features in a more bottom-up way. Like if you really take it serious about these geometric features of the beetle and lightweight structure, how would it look like, right? But then we've seen, I think, through some of the other projects where that um, becomes a little bit more controlled in a way. Uh, uh, when it, the closer it gets to architectural application and away from the pure research demonstrator, yeah, let's say. So that's one thing. Um, uh, um, uh, the other thing about the tooling and the uh, design space um, is um, uh, very, uh, very interesting. Um, what's my experience with that? Uh, my experience with that is actually that um, what I discussed earlier, yes, there's sometimes this um, element of surprise when you play with your uh, design tools and where you maybe, uh, if you constrain certain um, uh, movement areas of the robot, certainly some areas of your structure wouldn't work anymore, so uh, there's a little bit of balancing. Um, but actually, uh, to be honest, what we learned is that it's still... Um, very much um, knowledge and intuition based in the end also yeah? because uh, or at least in I mean let's say there's the academic part of it where you say yes there's there are very interesting computational design tools that allow you to navigate that space but actually when I see how it unfolds in practice in our company it's, it's a handful of people that just know their their repertoire of these components and uh, yes we use advanced tools but in the end it's still very much an architect's job of working with these tools and structures. Yeah? So it's very far from optimizing away the architect and push the button and something amazing comes out, but it's very much about knowing the processes, knowing the materials, um, which with all the traps that comes with that. Yeah? So if you quickly need to push out a project, the risk is pretty high that it looks like the one before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, uh, then uh, forcing yourself to also money-wise invest in the company and say no it's okay spend another week do a few more iterations and see what we can come up with question sorry um, <laughs> yeah also in terms of design but i was just coming myself from around the field i was just asking uh, what is the capacity of repair of already Yes, because we come from a field, you know, which has to do with heritage. Mm -hmm. And um, there is also, you know, great history, like with engineer after the Second World War, I mean, the last keynote, who reused torrent of cable in order you know, to, um, to find new um, technology or to employ a certain amount of metal into new structure mm -hmm. and it has you know, to be done very fast and it has to be a new type of ouvrage d'art in order to replace all the bridges, all those mm -hmm. things. I think you talked about the urban mining. Yeah. Uh, it's true that with the recent event in Ukraine, uh, we see that there is a huge amount of material which are going to be wasted in a way or another. All those bridges are down. Um, we saw some torrents of metal and I wanted to know, this leads to another question, how you can go with this concept to some sort of structural rationality, uh, meaning that um, instead of this being sometimes the cladding of a volume, which is very different, how this can be you know, the carrying structure itself and have 
some inner truthness in its design and draw some new possibility of volume can be in another scale, become a bridge. Those are the questions you have. Yeah. 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 Um, one project that I haven't shown is, is actually uh, a bridge. <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, uh, we have, uh, um, so I think the largest scale project that I showed was the facade, but a lot of projects we're working on are actually the main primary load bearing structure. Yeah? So uh, that for sure. But I think the second component of your question was more about um, circularity and urban mining and reusing of material. And um, that's something where we uh, switched from the classical, let's say, aerospace inspired epoxy with carbon fiber uh, structures, very, uh, let's say, um, high embodied energy but then very selective material use um, to make these high performance structures more towards using more material, but regrowing materials. So that's one switch uh, that we uh, do at the company to address the circularity aspect. And then what we do in, um, in our research um, uh, in Karlsruhe is that we most, that's why we work with the willow and earth structures. We're very much using materials that are in the biological cycle and even materials that are not highly processed in terms of the energy intensiveness, how like a lot of energy goes into drying construction wood, for example, and uh, we, we, we don't need that for our willow structures. Um, and um, are looking into components that, I mean, it's happening on several levels. So. First, we can, uh, tap, we can diversify the natural resources we tap into because currently no one is constructing with willow. Yeah? So we, we also don't, don't want to replace wood construction. Yeah? We're just saying th there can't be enough regrowing resources in, structure, in, in construction. So we just try to diversify the sources of materials we can tap into for construction. Yeah? So that's why we use with that. Um, then we use uh, digital fabrication technologies to um, reduce the amount of material we need to use. So I kind of disagree with uh, when people say mass timber is good because you have all the negative emissions in the wood in your structure. No, you actually still used a lot of wood for your structure and you could have probably built two buildings out of that, right? Uh, and um, I mean, you needed some uh, fire protection, soundproofing, etc. You know, but um, actually, if you can use less material, even if it's regrowing material, it's still better. Um, and um, uh, the next aspect of the circularity is that we want to design components for reassembly. Yeah? Uh, that uh, is something that is already um, also in our work at Fiber, uh, but also in the, in, in the components we're designing at the university, that those are very precise prefabricated components that can be very simply joined and disjoint again. Like there's nothing, they're not like glued together or cast on side or something like that. Yeah? Um, and then obviously the question is what happens at the end of the life? And if you have like a willow clay structure, uh, you can break it down, uh, use the clay again, uh, just decompose the willow somewhere so there's no toxic components, no waste involved, things like that. Yeah. So that's a little bit, on, on, on different hierarchies, we are addressing the level of circularity through digital methods yeah. also, and, and for load bearing structures, of course. Yeah. I have a last question, but it's more about the, the, the teaching. No, not the teaching, but the, the, the uh, academia. Mm -hmm. And it's not exactly for you, but, but for the students that, that follow the, uh, the course. I, I, I'm interested in because for something that somebody that has not done this, that is not, knows what grasshopper is, that uh, has not touched it a lot, it looks like the curve that you that we would have to do to implement that would be huge. But you, you did that in one semester. How do you affect that, or how was the experience? Can you tell us a little bit? Because it looks unreachable from <laughs> from the outside world. But the experience was quite nice. It was not too difficult. The, the first thing that helped me a lot was it was really, really hands on, and the first step we had to take was really to get to know the material. Because if you know the material. We can directly um, understand how, how it would work and it wouldn't work. And by doing this, we can just directly translate this into digital, digital tools. And we had a lot of uh, people who were already in good basis in these tools. So while there were five people thinking about what's possible with material, already two were knowledgeable and, and right and could use it. And also, like, even the employer and the teachers are very, very competent in helping us. 
So, um, yeah, not everybody was really, um, really good at drawing all these things, but everybody could really understand it because it's really hands on. And then, yeah, it worked in, in one semester, it went multiple steps, and a lot of um, we, had, we had to hand in some projects, and it works really well. And I think I would love to work more on it. And I think we could really push the concept behind it a lot further. But yeah, I was out at just one semester of time. More time will always be better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. yeah. Yeah, that's cool. thank you. Thank you. That's a good testimony of a student of our studio. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's actually, and it's so, so basically, all, the core of your question is correct because there is a steep learning curve, yeah, and that then involves also, let's say, um, a very intense teaching culture where I think some of our teaching assistants from the team were spend a lot of time in the studio working on the tools with the students and uh, yeah, supporting that. So. Other questions or comments? No? I think it was very fascinating to see all these incredible objects also. But it's not only objects, because that was for me the fascinating thing about the facade. Because there we have also a complex system that getting um, like an envelope or like a skin. Uh, so, and the skin is also has a function and uh, you said it already, you have to do a lot of studies that is really uh, on a long way, very um, stable, and, uh, and also it's a kind of new way to think about facades. I think it's very, I have a, in mind a little bit the, the sample um, idea about that the facade is also a skin, and then you can put it really in a kind of a skin like building. That's very interesting. I think we can go back in this way. And this research by design, of course, it's a, a way to, and because always in architecture we have this problem that. Is uh, uh, when we do designing, is it research? Is it not? Uh, it's always this kind of uh, in between. And I think you, with your conference, uh, I think it's very convincing that we can do research by design. Uh, and it's, uh, of course, fundamental research also a little bit. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of design, a lot of things we can put together and also by teaching and practicing. So for me, it was a really uh, fascinating. Uh, moment to see how we can deal all this together and I think very much uh, or thank you very much for this uh, nice lecture and uh, I hope we see you soon in yes. Strasbourg or in, exactly. by, by in another way in a workshop or something yeah, that could yeah. be very interesting for we us. We should for sure keep in touch and yeah. I think it, it's a good bridge that we can build up yeah. for the future. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. It would be great. Thank you very much. Ich denke, wenn wir es jetzt aufgezeichnet haben, kann es ja dann doch nochmal. Ja, ja, genau.